So this is the second part of the code-based cryptography lecture. Um, we have already seen the MacLeese crypto system and we're now going to look into another system due to Harald Niederreiter and also look into, well, what goes wrong with the schoolboard versions that I'm showing you here. We need a little bit more of the theory, so I'm going to jump into some more uh, notions from coding theory, namely we need the notion of a systematic form. So we have seen the generator matrix, and we have seen the parity check matrix of codes, and we have seen that the, well, a code is the linear subspace of F2 to the n, and we can describe it as a row space of a generator matrix, or as the kernel space of a parity check matrix. Now, this generator matrix we can write in different forms. There's not a unique way of writing it. You can just add two of the rows and you get another valid one, like Gaussian elimination, for instance. And sometimes, well, it was about one third probability, you can write it in what we call systematic form. So that means you're doing a full Gaussian elimination so that the first k by k sub matrix becomes an identity matrix. Since we are over F2, this is not always possible, as I said, just one third of the time, roughly. But if it's possible, then this is a particular nice way of writing it. So the Q becomes the redundant part, so that's the K times N minus K, and the first part is called the information part, or the information bits. And then if you're thinking of the classical decoding problem where you want to recover the message as M from the M times G, so this is not like the message is in the MacLeese system, this is just the error correcting code view where the Q part adds redundancy and the first part is the pure information. So if you have multiplied M by G and G's in systematic form, then the first K positions of C are just a copy of M. Another thing where the systematic form is nice for is to relate the generator matrix and the parity check matrix of a code. So if you're given one how can you compute the other thing? So if you have it in systematic form, then this expression there, so taking the Q, transposing it, and putting the identity, well now an N minus K identity matrix after it, that I postulate is a parity check matrix for the same code. Easy enough, but is it true? Well, to prove that it's true, we have to show that every code word, so everything that is generated as m times g is actually going to give 0 when multiplied by this h. Okay, so let's take this h times m times g transpose, flip the order because of the transposes, and then we are expanding what the h and the g looks like, and we're getting this product of matrices. And so if you're looking at the um, first matrix times the second matrix, then each time you have a piece of Q times the identity, so that gets exactly that piece of Q, and then you're adding this part of Q to the other part of Q, so those things cancel out modulo 2. So that actually gives a zero matrix at the beginning, and so no matter what this M was that you picked, you're always going to get zero times M, which is zero. So yes, actually, um, Every code word is in the kernel space of this H. So this is a valid parity check matrix for this code. If you have to transmit this H or if you store it, then it's also nice that you can actually kind of forget about the identity part. Everybody knows that the last um, n minus k by n minus k positions are the identity matrix, so you don't have to store it. So for instance, for the parity check matrix of the Hemi code we saw in the first lecture, Instead of having a 3 by 7 matrix, I can store it as a 3 by 4 matrix. Now, anything which actually needs the computation, then I have to remember that there is still this identity matrix at the end. But that is, well, an identity matrix, so it's just copying the positions of the vector when I multiply it. The parity check form is also good for a different way of decoding. And so here's another uh, vocabulary, so another name from coding theory, namely the syndrome of a vector. So if you have received this x, so that's not a necessarily a valid code word, this might be an erroneous code word, then the syndrome of x is h times x. So x is length n, and the syndrome is just the height of h, so that's n minus k. And then you trace it through, so you know that every code word, um, 
well, h times c gives zero. So the syndrome does not depend on what c was, it only depends on what the error vector is. So the syndrome is an indication of what error has happened. And then the syndrome decoding problem, as opposed to regular decoding problem, is to find e given s. And there's typically also the requirement that e should have minimum weight. But that's also what we have in the regular decoding problem. You want to find the closest code word to what you've received. Similarly here, you want to find the e of minimum weight. Now assume you have a algorithm that allows you to do syndrome decoding. Can you use it for doing regular decoding? That is kind of obviously true. So if you have that sitting around, you toss in your k, uh, your x, and you compute the syndrome, which you can do because it's a parity check matrix. For instance, if it's in systematic form or if you're given only g, you have to sort of invert it to get h, but you can always compute a matching h. Then you use your syndrome decoder, you get e, and from e you can get back to c. The other direction is less obvious. So if you have a regular decoder, that means it needs an input of length n, but you're only given the syndrome. So you're only given this n minus k length vector. How can you get a full length n vector that is matching? Now, it doesn't matter um, which code word you add to it, but you need to find something which has the same error vector. So syndrome decoding problem says, well, find the e. Now let's assume that the h, the parity check matrix, is given in systematic form. And you're given s. So find any vector x so that s is equal to h times x. Now s has the same height as the identity matrix. So if we choose our vector to have all zeros in the first positions, then those get multiplied by the q part of the matrix. So it doesn't matter really what's in the q part. And the last n minus k positions, those get, well, multiplied by the identity matrix, so those get mapped to themselves. And so the result of this particular x given on the slide there times h is s, because, well, the s gets just multiplied by the identity matrix, and nothing from the first columns that has this q there actually comes into the syndrome. Ah, so we've now solved the syndrome decoding problem because I mean, here is an x which has the syndrome. Now, normally this is not the well solution. So this, normally this s has a very high Hamming rate, like randomly n minus k over 2. So this is not what you're looking for. Of course, if you have a super sparse s, so if s has already fewer or t or fewer positions set, then this x that I just calculated here is the right error, but not normally. So normally we would take this x, ask our regular decoding problem, uh, regular decoding algorithm to give us the code word. From the code word, well, we know x plus c is e, so we get e, and e is the valid syndrome decoding. Okay, so now that we have this equivalence, we can admire the Niederreiter version of the crypto system. So Niederreiter in 1986 said, hey, um, I got another idea we can do the same data flow as with MacLeese, but slightly shorter. So he wanted to use the parity check matrix rather than the generator matrix. So um, most ideas are the same taken over from, from MacLeese. So there's again a computation matrix running around, and again this is going to be applied to the error vector, and we're using that the permutation vector, the permutation matrix doesn't increase the weight of it. And there is some invertible matrix so that we get some randomness there. So we have H being the gener the parity check matrix of a nice decode, decodable code, and K being the parity check matrix of a random looking code. So that's the scrambled version of H. We have to trace through which sides this go on, but we're going to see in a moment that this is the right order. So K is going to be s times h times p. And then the encryption is just syndrome computation. So this ciphertext is the syndrome of the error vector. Now, 
if you wanted to use this for regular encryption, then there's a little bit of a nasty thing that you need to take your message and turn it into an n bit vector of weight t. But nowadays, we encrypt random messages and use those to generate a symmetric key. We only use the public key encryption for the handshake, and afterwards, we use symmetric cryptography for actually sending our message. So nowadays, we're totally happy to make a random n bit vector t, uh, e of weight t and call this our plain text. Then the cyber text is a syndrome of this E, and if K is the heart of the code code, then, well, that E is pretty well hidden in, in S. And then the decryption problem is to find E, well, of the right, right weight, so that this gets through the syndrome. And so at this point, the, well, X that I had on the previous slide would not be a valid version because this S very, is very unlikely to have weight T. So if you're the passive attacker, if you're Eve, then what you have to decode is, well, you have a random looking key, a random looking code, and you have to correct T errors. But if you're Alice, or let's say the Bob is now the receiver, so if you're Bob and you actually made this key yourself, you know more. You know S, you know H, and you know P, and with that you have a much better way to decode it. So let's look at this in detail. So the decryption, if you have the secret key, if you know the private key here. So you compute S inverse, well, this was this inverted matrix, times the ciphertext, lowercase s. And then the S inverse again cancels the S, actually in a somewhat nicer way than in MACLE, so there's no linear equations, just, well, it's one long product. So the S part cancel, and you're left with H times P times E, which I now put parentheses around, so the P times E is again of weight t, same as in the MACLE system. So this one we can decode. And on the left, we have the new syndrome, which is s inverse times s. So we now ask our syndrome decoding for h, so that's our nice code, hey, give us the error which was in here. And then it spits out p times e, and from p times e we can compute e. So because we knew what s P and PR, and we know how to decode H efficiently, we can actually solve this problem. This is not for Eve, this is just for Bob. If you look at what codes are used for the MACD system, I was very in detail. I was saying, okay, they're using binary GOPA codes, and I was showing the parameters, and actually those are the codes that we currently use. So um, with a bunch of collaborators, we have a submission to the NIST competition on post-quantum cryptography, and we called it classic MacLeese because it is basically the same system that MacLeese invented in 78. There are some performance improvements, but it's the same security anal analysis as what MacLeese did back then. For Niederreiter, I didn't show you what codes he used. And actually, if you would be searching for a system, you would be finding that his system is broken. Well, it's not the data flow that is broken because, well, the data flow, we've just seen that syndrome decoding and regular decoding are equivalent, so if you could break MacLeese, you could break Niederreiter and vice versa, but he was suggesting to use different codes. He was suggesting to use Reed solomon codes, and those have too much structure. So even though he was suggesting to use random S and random P, the structure of the Reed solomon codes was still visible in the K. So if you want to replace the binary copper codes, you need to have a family which is sufficiently large, because, well, <laughs> else there would be uh, just, say, a handful of keys, and so the attacker could just use through the, uh, search through those. And you need to have something which is looking fairly random after multiplication with other matrices. And so there were a bunch of uh, systems proposed that had too much structure. But there's more than just binary copper codes. We're going to focus on, on binary copper codes here, but there are other codes. So if you look at the NIST competition, and you look at the submissions, or also final rounds, there are, um, there's at least one, well, there's one system which is using quasi-cyclic medium density parity check codes, so other codes are also possible. Also, word of warning, never use the Scooper version. I've been highlighting this uh, in my other online class where I'm going through RSA and highlighting how you never should use the Scooper version, and the same is definitely true also for code-based crypto. 
These systems, as I presented now, are good for understanding the hard problem, to understand what the attacker has to break if they want to go after the, the core of the problem, like the math problem. But it's so easy to have attackers as an attacker to just sneak around. So let me introduce to you the sloppy Alice attack. So that goes back to 1998, Eric Verhoel, Jürgen Down, and, and Hank Tilburg, which um, has a fairly reasonable assumption, namely that Bob is using a system that can correct up to T errors. So if you're taking a normal decoding algorithm that is written for, well, a normal situation in coding theory, you don't even know how many errors there are. You just know you can correct up to T errors. But if instead of t errors you find t minus 5, you're happy and you decode as well. And so if the crypto system behaves the same way, then if somebody sends you something which only has t minus 1, t minus 2 errors, you will be obtaining the correct code word, well, obtaining c, and then obtaining the correct m. Now here's how this attack works. It's a little bit different from our normal attacks where we assume that eve is just an eavesdropper. This is a very active Alice. Uh, active Eve. Eve is actually interacting with Bob and she's posing as Alice. So she will tell, hey Bob, here's my ciphertext. She is Alice. And she's doing this in order to figure out what plain text Alice sent to Bob. So this, all of this is in order to decipher one single ciphertext. So Eve intercepts the ciphertext, it's a MacLeese ciphertext Y, and she wants to figure out what M was. And she will just watch Bob's reaction. So either Bob gets the message or Bob sends back, um, Alice, your, your ciphertext wasn't valid. I'm having trouble here. Could you send it again? And this small reaction, this Bob remains quiet, so can he decrypt it? Or Bob writes back, hey, I couldn't decrypt this. Please write again. Are enough for Eve to break this? So let's start with an assumption. Let's assume that Alice encrypted this properly. Um, so that the weight of this error vector E is exactly T. So if then Alice changes the ciphertext by flipping one bit, then she either flipped from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. I mean, she knows how she flipped it, but she doesn't know whether this is a bit which is affecting by E or not. So let's take the code word C apart, and then there's this E part. And if we add some unit vector to it, like the i's unit vector to flip the i bit here, then we either flip it from a 0 to a 1 or from a 1 to a 0. If you think of the MacLeese example of 1024 different positions and just 50 error position, most of the times you will encounter the 0 flips to 1. And sometimes you'll encounter a 1 that flips to a 0. Well, and Eve can figure out which one it was. She sends this modified ciphertext to Bob and sees how he reacts. So Bob says, mm, couldn't decrypt. That means it flipped from 0 to 1. Bob remains quiet. Uh -huh, it flipped from 1 to 0. So she does this for the first, second, third, till the kth position. And well, she only needs k positions because that's the length of m. And so she has just figured out what the first m positions of e were and so that means she actually gets to clear the part of e on the first positions and she just inverts this first sub matrix of g prime okay you should stop me now well you can't because i'm online so i'm stopping myself here now okay i'm glancing over some technical difficulties here i'm assuming that this part is invertible okay what you would be doing to do this properly you first figure out the positions like the k by k submatrix, so just k, k columns of g prime which are invertible, and then you just probe for those k positions. And then you guarantee that you can invert it, and then you're getting m from that. So that means Bob receives lots and lots of copies, well, typically k copies of small variations of the ciphertext. So the name Sloppy Alice comes from Bob receiving so many invalid ciphertexts from Alice that he thinks that Alice is sloppy. Well, she's not. It's Eve posing as Alice, but he doesn't know that. If you look at the paper, you actually see a more complicated version 
we're just looking for general fields at Q rather than just F2, but for our scenario, F2 is, is all we need. And the different attack for this, the uh, different name for these attacks, namely reaction attacks. So a year later, uh, Paul Goldberg and Schneier were posting a, a broader paper where they investigated more crypto systems under such active attacks, where they showed how to either even get the private key or at least decrypt by such interaction by seeing how the other party reacts on invalid ciphertext. And if you thought this was just something on the, on the MacLeese system, now we can do the same thing on the NeedWriter version as well. You just have to figure out what it means to flip a bit in E. Okay, so we have our H, we're getting the S as a syndrome, and then we have this E times H as a multiplication. We want to flip a bit here. So well, this bit here will be just picking that column. So flipping the ith bit just means we're adding the ki, the ith column of k to the central. So that is the equivalent modified ciphertext to what we've done on the previous slide. Now a more realistic scenario where this um, algorithm for decoding is not written by coding theories, but actually written by a parallel cryptographer, is that, well, it insists on having exactly t errors. So it will fail if it's t plus 1, and it will fail if it's t minus 1. So, well, Alice flips, the Eve flips a bit, and it fails. So she has not learned anything. Eve doesn't learn anything. But okay, Eve is smart, and she realized, oh, she can flip two bits at the same time. So if you flip, flip two bits, and both of them were zeros, you flip both of them to ones. So you have changed the weight from t to t plus 2, so it fails. Both of them were 1s, well, it changed from t to t minus 2. It fails. But if one of them was 1 and one of them was 0, then they just flip, so the weight doesn't change. And so Eve now has to try more pairs, and she'll have to solve some linear system of equations afterwards, but this is something that Eve knows how to do, and so it's more involved You'll probably have to take a sheet of paper to actually trace this through, but it's fully doable. So that doesn't protect the system. So making the decoding algorithm more nitpicky is not a solution. You can, of course, control how much information you give away. Tom Burson came up with another attack. So this is like if, if Alice, or our sender is now Alice, so if Alice sends the same message, but twice with different encryptions. So if it's not the sloppy Alice, but she's sending to Bob today something and tomorrow something. And you know this was the same message, you just don't know exactly what it was. Maybe she's sending good morning every day, or she's sending I love you every day. Whatever Alice is sending, Eve wants to know. Well, she only knows it's the same. But we are aware of two, and so here's a funny thing. You can just add those two ciphertexts. And if you add those two ciphertexts, the m times g part just goes away. And so what you're left with is E1 plus E2. Let's call this E bar. So this E bar, well, you're getting in plane there. Well, you don't know how these two T positions or most two T positions split over E1 and E2 and sticking with the original example. So if you have a um, hundred position set and you have to investigate all possible splits of 50 into 50, that is inconvenient, takes quite a while, but you can actually do better. What you see is, what is the weight of E bar? One possibility is it has weight exactly 2t. So that means there was no cancellations between the positions of E1 and E2. Well, n is a lot larger than t. n is still a lot larger than 2t. So you actually have knowledge of n minus 2t positions, which are error-free. And so similar to what we just did in the sloppy Alice attack, you can invert g prime in those columns, or find a subset of k by k, and then you can recover n. So this is actually the easiest case. So seeing something where the error is large, if it's full 2t, it's already done. If not, well, we know now some positions which are set, so we know those, say, let's call this 2w, we know those positions are definitely in error, so we ignore those, 
and then we have just the missing 2t minus 2w positions to find in some shortened version of g prime. So that is a much smaller decoding problem, which is typically much, much easier. So the easiest is if there's no overlap, but even if there's overlap, this does save a lot. And well, given the length, there's a fairly low chance of having much overlap. Okay, so now I've been ranting enough about uh, schoolbook versions, so what is the way out? From all we know, well, at least for good codes, the MacLeese or MetaWriter um, crypto systems are one-way functions. So it is hard to get back the plain text from the ciphertext. That is what the crypt analysts look at, and this is where we have some high confidence, some pretty good confidence. But if you would be using them um, as described, then they're not CCA2 secure. Well, you we have already seen two attacks of how they would break under some somewhat active attacks or under or combination attacks. Um, let's play the typical CCA security game. So that means you're given a challenge ciphertext and you can ask for decryption of anything but one. So we're totally forgetting about the phase, first phase of this attack, jumping right in, in the second phase, we have received our challenge and now we can ask for decryptions of anything but this challenge ciphertext Y. So Y is a code word that we're very interested in, plus E. So can we find some Y prime, which looks different from Y, and will decode? Now, if you've seen the previous pages, you might be thinking how oh, we can do the same thing as with the sloppy Alice attack. We can flip a bit in E, then it looks different, um, then we cover it and so that would work, but actually there's an even easier way. So if you think of all CCA2 attacks with an RSA, then you're on the right track. So you can just add another code word, which you know, that doesn't change the error vector. You change the ciphertext, you're getting Y plus C, so that's some Y prime, this is totally valid. So you can ask your Oracle, and then you're getting the sum of m and m bar as the decryption, and well, m bar was what you put in, so you just subtract m bar. Now, how to do this properly? You can apply CCA2 transform, or you can do what I was describing in the in the need writer version, that you pick a random t and you use the hash of it as a secret key for well, some symmetric cipher. So be careful when you're using code-based cryptography. Don't use it as described here. I mean, this is the core idea, use this for the security analysis. But if you actually want to use it for real, do go for the CCA2 secure versions. But everything that's submitted to the NIST competition is at least CPA secure. And most systems, and definitely the classic MACD system, has actually taken the extra work of becoming CCA2 secure.